steps and when I make a knit top I always start with the shoulder seam and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this do you stabilize the shoulder seam I do you put something on the back piece in order to keep the shoulder seam from not stretching out when you're sewing because there are different diff two different schools here basically either you use some type of stabilizer I prefer to use um, clear elastic but it can definitely itch a little bit so it's not not everyone's preference or I like to use uh, some type of stabilizer uh, this one is um, it's a tape, tape which has a little bit of a give because person if you're going to stabilize your shoulder seam on it it definitely needs to have some stretch because in Sweden we have some uh, knit stabilizing tape that is woven and it's absolutely rigid and I don't like this so I personally like to stabilize my shoulder seam because I like my shoulder seam to be you know I like my tops to be quite close fitting so I don't like them to extend too much outside the my actual natural shoulder and sometimes um, when you're not stabilizing there's always a little bit of a risk especially if you're using a sewing machine and don't have access to different differential feet to keep it together it's definitely you know a little bit of stretch out will happen and that if you like your shoulder to be a bit extended it doesn't really matter but if you like to keep them nice and tight as the same width as the pattern has designed I definitely recommend stabilizing so I'm really curious if a are you stabilizing your shoulder seams and b what type of technique do you use to stabilize the shoulder and um, Greg says yes the stabilizer and Kathy says I use knit stabilizer in the shoulder because there's also one good thing if you look inside a lot ready to wear you can actually use a strip of knit fabric because you know obviously uh, most knits are much more stretchy crosswise but lengthwise uh, especially if it's not a lycra fabric it's actually quite stable on a lot of knits so sometimes in the garment industry they cut a strip uh, lengthwise and then you just get the perfect amount of give and then you just sew that in the shoulder seam when you're attaching the front and the back and um, they always it's the stabilizing is usually placed in the back piece because usually also you you press the the shoulder seam right if that makes sense you press that backwards uh, I don't think there's an exception to any exception to that rule, but I'd love to hear if you have any. But that's a normal way of doing it, and that way you also hide the whatever type of stabilizing material you use that won't be visible from the inside because that's sort of folded backwards, if that makes sense. And um, Duncan says, if necessary, I use wash away. If not, I'm using the overlocking differential feet, and that's really good because that can help a lot actually. Just the overlock, especially if you're not super. Um, you know you want to be really rigid and Cecilia says I attach a thin gross grain ribbon with a seam when I surge the shoulder seam oh gross grain ribbon I hadn't thought about that it's a really nice idea as well and um, Louise says I choose a pattern with raglan sleeve then I don't have to stabilize good point definitely I don't think I've ever seen a stabilized raglan sleeve because that's that's usually much easier to control in that sense when you do it um, Bettina says, I do sometimes. I've used clear elastic, but sewing out loud. Recently talked about using power shape and net power mesh, and I'll give that a go. That's a really nice tip. I'm a big fan of using power net and power mesh. I use it a lot for other purposes when I'm stabilizing knits, like um, use it instead of a fusible interfacing. But I hadn't thought about using it in the shoulder seam. That's a really good idea. Uh, if you haven't already, I highly recommend that you check out the Sewing Out Loud podcast because they absolutely packed each episode with so many useful sewing tips. I learned, have learned so much from them, so that's a great idea. And uh, Judith says, I do the elastic one. I use it for ruffle as well. That's also a really good idea. I've also, on my blog, I've several tutorials on how, how I use clear elastic. So it's a lot, it has a lot of use for sure. Uh, you have to be ca careful a bit when you're ironing because it's made of silicone, I think, and uh, that can actually uh, melt if the iron is a bit too hot. So that's one of the things. But so really good idea here is on ways to stabilize the shoulder. Now, depending on what you're going to do next, um, if you're doing some type of binding. You might want to actually leave one shoulder open, so you just close one shoulder seam, and then because this is a good example. Um, the teacher I was talking about, I showed you earlier. This teacher is not using binding; it's using ribbing, but it's a very simply constructed um, T-shirt. 
So there you can see here what they have done. They have actually stitched uh, the ribbing of the um, the neckline before they close the second shoulder seam. Uh, so that's definitely something um, you can do. I know. I think a lot of us in the sewing community, we all we're very uh, how shall I how shall I say? We really enjoy having garments. It looks as nice on the inside as on the outside. So I don't think this method is as popular among us. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think a lot of us actually prefer when we or attaching some type of um, neck finishing to, to stitch that as a circle and then add it to the, um, the garment. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll often see this in ready to wear because it's so quick, because uh, you do it in like everything is flatly sewn. Uh, but definitely a ribbing, I personally don't see the necessar necessity of doing it like they do, but if you're doing binding, it is easier if you leave one seam open. You can also do some ways. For instance, um, the one top I'm wearing right now, this is binding. As you can see, I have actually closed the seam, but I use different method and not a regular binding attachment. And I described this, in, in fact, this method I described in both my, my book, Sewing Activewear and Master the Cover Stitch Machine, if you're curious. Uh, but if you're using a binding attachment, it's definitely easier if you are closing the shoulder seam after you attach the binding. Uh, you can do it uh, without, but it's definitely harder to get right. So, But it comes down to a bit of preference as well. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about that as well. Do you like to attach you know, your neckline finishing as a, a circle, or do you like to leave one shoulder seam open? But now, for this example, I'm definitely going to close both shoulder seam. And then we come my next step it's always to stitch the neckline because I have my I have my steps because I, I think that you know after you've been sewing for a lot of time you realize uh, a good sort of assembly order that minimizes problem and one problem you can often have when you're working with knits especially if they're not really stable is that uh, certain parts especially if they cut around like this they have a tendency of growing and that is going to be super annoying so I actually like to make sure that I finish the neckline before I actually start stitching together the sleeves and the bodies and doing the hemming because then I know that I won't be filling too much with the fabric. So that's why I actually prefer to use this method. Just to, after the shoulder seam is done, I definitely like to straight move on to the neckline finish. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. And... Um, Duncan says, open only if cover stitching and definitely circle much easier. Yes, and it looks so much nicer as well, right? Because we do get, you don't get a bulky seam. And Judy says, I always close the first neckline finish before I add it to the neckline. I tend to think that our handmade clothing will look much more beautiful compared to red to wear garments. I totally agree. And since we don't, we don't stitch for time, most of us, um, we can take the time of really, you know, working towards you know having nice finishing rather than you know being able to stitch as many t-shirts as possible in in one hour so that definitely also um changes the way we view it i think and also because i think so many of us are really interested in you know in in working on improving our techniques and, and learning to make more beautiful finishing so it's definitely much more rewarding i personally agree with you you did to make that sort of um uh, extra effort you know just making things look nicer on the inside as well so that's how i do it and now the neckline opening now when you're sewing with knits there are lots of different options that you can do one is of course binding but obviously the most common the probably the most common one for t-shirts if we're talking that specifically is to use ribbing a ribbing is well it's supposed to be quite straightforward uh because you know you just use ribbing but one tricky part uh, when you are attaching ribbing is that you really need to think about um, how to calculate basically on how much you need to stretch out the ribbing because if you want the ribbing to lie flat and you definitely want that especially and um, you know the wider the ribbing is the more difficulty you will have of lying it flat and we all again I think you know if you look to a lot of ready weighters you will see that the um, the ribbing will actually, you know, stand up and be a bit stretched out. But I think a lot of us really like to get the flat, nice ribbing. And then you definitely need to work with a lot of negative ease. And I'd love to give you one specific straight answer of how much shorter the ribbing should be. But I have to say it depends a lot. It depends on the quality of the ribbing, for instance. 
If you're using a uh, ribbing without any type of spandex, so it's basically just 100% cotton, that ribbing will stretch out more and ha have less recovery usually than if you're working with a ribbing that also has some lycra or spandex in it. Um, so for instance, if you're working with that soft uh, cotton 100% ribbing or interlock, then you can definitely, you know, it depends again on, as I said, the width of the ribbing, but you can definitely perhaps go 65, 70 percent if you want to get that nice flat ribbing that really looks you know it doesn't stand out but it looks nice and flat uh, and also you have to you know make sure that the ribbing is evenly spread so i actually like to do calculation on that so i start you know by figuring out the midpoint in the front so i just cut a little bit notch and then in the back and the shoulder seam so i have actually four measuring points and then i stretch it stretch out the ribbing and especially here, if you have like a deeper neckline, it's so, so important to stretch it out properly because otherwise it's quite easy to to, to get the, the ribbing to gape if you're working with um, a more scooped out neckline. Uh, so that's definitely one of the tricky things, I think, when it comes to ringing, especially because it behaves differently. Uh, but the general rule is definitely that the wider the ribbing, the... the the lesser percentage basically if in order to get it flat flat so if you're just doing like a short ribbing uh, just a tiny ribbing then of course you don't need to stretch out it as much but in, whoops, you need to get that sort of flat shape round shaping um, and hope says with a very stretchy neckline how to stabilize before you attach the neckline binding i want the neck the stretch to put on. Um, I actually, um, I don't try uh, to stabilize the neckline when I'm using knits because it can alter the um, properties of the fabric. But there are a couple of things you can do definitely. And one is that you could um, uh, use a low basting, hand basting a little bit just to keep in check a little bit, especially if it starts to grow. Uh, if you already have been in a situation where it has been stretched out and you have a surgery, you can increase the differential feed and then edge, edge stitch overcast uh, the um, opening uh, using high differential feed because that will pull the neckline together. Uh, but the most important thing is to not meddle with the fabric too much and to use some type of neckline finishing that will sort of pull back the fabric uh, in, in the good shape. And I'm going to give you one more tip about just in just a minute. Um, and Cecilia, I once read that you should stretch pull differently, less over the shoulders and more center front. Uh, yes, that is correct. So that's one of the problems also with using formula that, that I said that I do, but definitely uh, the more the curve is, if you're using ribbing here, if you're using ribbing uh, here, uh, as, as soon as it's a bit round, you definitely need to stretch out it a little bit more. But then you also have the issue if you stretch out it too much in one spot, then of course, you know, the more we stretch the fabric, the more narrow it will get. And you definitely don't want ribbing to be um, stretched <laughs> more narrow in, in the, the front and then a slightly wider because you haven't stretched it as much. So, I think I personally find it a little bit difficult to find that happy medium. I'm not really 100% sold that yet. So I try to find that happy medium so I don't stretch it too too differently just because I want, you know, to make sure that the width is consistent around the entire opening, if that makes sense. Uh, Natasha says there's an echo, but it's, it's not... Is it too bad or is it is it okay? Um, I've noticed that it, sometimes it happens an echo and I'm not really sure why, but um, I'll do my best to see if I can move the mic, if that helps. Um, so that's some ideas about the neckline finishing. And of course, there are other ways of doing it as well. Uh, I, I talked about ribbing now and binding, but sometimes you want to use a matching fabric for the neckline so you don't because ribbing obviously has different properties and you're perhaps not always able to find the exact same colorway then you can actually use self fabric like this so on this top I've actually used the same fabric and it's not super stretching it um, as you can see like this and 
The trick you need to know if you are deciding on using self fabric instead of a ribbing fabric is that you definitely need to be a rather narrow strip because it doesn't have the same uh, stretchy properties. It will definitely not lie flat if you go like wide and say perhaps 2.5 centimeters or one inch, if that makes sense. Um, so you definitely need to figure that out as well. And um, one thing that is, I find uh, makes a huge difference and that is stitching down the the bind, the bind, <laughs> the, bind. Uh, the band or the ribbing afterwards. So if you have a little bit of a problem, if you feel like the the finishing sort of flops back and forth, um, just stitching it down, either using your cobble stitch machine if you have one, or a regular twin needle on your sewing machine works really well as well. So you definitely don't need to have a cobble stitch to do this. Uh, you can of course also use zigzag stitch if you want that sort of decorative effect. So just if you can see that just stitching it down like this makes a huge difference of getting those band to lie flat. So if you have like you you've been sewing a ribbing like ah oh, maybe and you put it on and sort of gapes a little bit and you see perhaps a little bit of wrinkling here because you have maybe stretched the ribbing quite a lot to make it lie flat. Just stitching down the seam allowance will make a huge difference in most cases. So it can definitely be worth the extra effort if you really want to get that top notch result, if that makes sense. And uh, Way says, how narrow would you recommend? Now, if I'm using uh, cell fabric, for instance, in this case, I think that I, before I stretch it out, because obviously it will be a bit narrow since I stretch it out, I think it was about, um, Two, uh, I think, how shall I say, oh, I'm trying to make calculation in the head now and also transfer it to inches because we don't have that in Sweden. But I think with uh, without seam allowance, I think the it is about two centimeters uh, wide and of course folded. So four centimeters in total. And that would be like four, four, oh, I can't remember the, how you say the fractions. Please tell me in the comment section again. Um, but four, four or five inches, I think. I hope I say that right. And then, of course, you have to add seam allowance and depending on your preference. But if you do, you were like one centimeters, uh, or you do like um, less than that. I like to use less. But I hope that makes sense. Uh, way if you explain this, so definitely narrow. When you do ribbing, uh, you can definitely go up to I think about three three centimeters, which is a bit more than one inch. Uh, could definitely work as well. But the, the wider you do it, the more uh, trouble you will have <laughs> of getting it lie flat, uh, especially if the ribbing is a bit tricky. And uh, also Greg has a good point, a nice press will help to absolutely. If you're working, uh, especially if you're working with natural fibers such as cotton and you're a little bit unhappy with, you know, the shaping, you know, just a little bit of ironing. And that's so, so important to actually iron. Uh, the ribbing. I always do that when I do cotton ribbing uh, on a cotton t-shirt. Always press it. It makes a big difference. Um, and well says, do your top stitch toward the neckline or the shirt, but always, always down. So downwards. Uh, hope that makes sense. I know you, you probably can't see it, but uh, so I press it down like this um, and then stitch it down. Because if you put it up, you will sort of make it flip outside. So that's that's always good when you're thinking about oh if you're doing a yoke for instance so if you're thinking about you know how to top stitch you definitely uh, flip the seam allowance back and forth and see how that alter um, the the shaping of the garment and then that will give you a good clue on which direction you top stitch but always stitch down when you're doing uh, stitching down ribbing on the neckline and uh, I've also got some calculation help now here. Judy says one is is 2.54 centimeters. I believe yes, that's true. I think, and four fifths or fourth uh, slash five then, but four fifths. Okay. Uh, and Cecilia says because before coming across your channel, I've never heard of a cover stitch machine, and it's so taking my sewing of stretch fabrics to the next level. Yes, it is true. It makes a huge difference because it's so wonderful because you're able to control the stretchiness just like you were doing with the surgery without with the differential feed and that just gives a more professional finish and Rachel says four centimeters um, that's about 2.5 inches wide thank you so much Rachel for doing the math for me <laughs> and uh, Empress says thank you that makes sense 
and Daisy says knits are not my friend I'd love to hear more about that and see if we can help you with that one uh, it definitely is not easy it might seem easy because it's, there are less steps involved say compare if you're sewing a pair of trousers or a tailored jacket but it's a lot about understanding how to control fabrics and using the t right type of fabric depending on properties so these were some of the neckline finishes um, obviously if you're doing a v-neck uh, you can either you know stitch the the v-neck ribbing I'm going to take a ready wettage here again you can stitch the, um, the v-neck you know uh, both on the inside so there's no actually seam like this you actually shape it and then fold it so you um, oh, I'm so bad at explaining this but I'm going to show the opposite way and the simplest way of doing a v-neck is that instead of you know uh, stitching it down both on the inside and outside you can also stitch like a little bit a little dart here to shape it so for instance on this uh, ready to wear top that I'm having here it's uh, it's binding that is stitched like a v-neck and that is done just doing this tiny little dot it does add a little bit of a bulk on the inside but a lot of ready to wear use is because it's so fast so you can definitely do it with ribbing as well just stitching that little dot to make uh, like an oval shape will then definitely turn into like a, a sharp V shape if that makes sense um, I do this, uh, let me see here, we have more great uh, numbers conversions here and full set is 1.57 inches, yes 1.5 inches, thank you so much. Um, and Lorenz says your new cover stitch book helped me to fix a problem with tunneling, love my binding attachment on my cover stitch machine. Yes, again, that's one of the things that definitely make a huge difference and thank you so much Lorraine for the kind words about my book. Um, and that cover stitch this definitely also makes it easier to attach binding. You can actually um, use a regular um, binder attachment or your generic binding attachment and a twin needle as well to, to stitch uh, binding. I have, uh, I know a, a local woman here in um, where I live called Erika and she has, she sells one of those generic binders that also work with a sewing machine. I was able to try that and it worked fantastically well. The trick is to use the right type of binding fabric but you can actually do that. So if you don't have a cover stitch machine yet, you can also stitch, try to stitch binding using a twin needle. It won't perhaps be exactly as nice but a lot of people actually have been successful with it and use, a lot of Swedish people actually use this for uh, when they're sewing um, children's wear they actually use a binding attachment on the sewing machine to stitch that down and Glenda says walking foot has helped me managing knits on my sewing machine because that's a good point as well because the, the biggest thing obviously is that uh, when you're, you're using on a regular sewing machine with how the um, I'm going to explain this really bad I'm just apologies in advance but when the the presser foot uh, moves and the feed dogs so it will uh, it will push the upper layer of the fabric and it sort of stretch that out and if you're using walker foot walking foot that will keep um, the fabric in check just like a similar thing that happens when you're using a differential feed on a serger or a cover stitch machine because that's probably the biggest problem right when you're sewing when it is that you know it's, it tends to stretch out and you definitely need to control that so that's why a walking foot can absolutely come in place and um, Judith says your book is really helpful thank you so much well thank you so much Judith for your kind words about my book and um, uh, Jackie says almost missed you we have to go back to the beginnings afterwards for sure and it will also pop up uh, in my feed after about an hour afterwards as well so you can definitely watch it anytime afterwards and Yeti says, can you make a lesson with tape binder and cover stitch machine? Yes, I will probably do a video tour about that as well. I do explain it in both my book, Sewing Activewear, and in my new book, Most of the Cover Stitch Machine, but I can definitely see if I can do some tutorial. Also, I have I have a tutorial on my blog as well about how to use the tape binder, or uh, for a cover stitch machine at least, on my blog, thelaststitch.com. So I realized that I've, I've actually talked about it, <laughs> but I haven't done a video about it yet. But uh, there's a lot of resources and lots of other tutorials as well on YouTube when it comes to the, the binder attachment. Um, yes, so that was the neckline. And now I'd love to hear your uh, ideas, thoughts about this, because um, I'm never going to go back a long time ago when I began sewing with knits in the 80s and the instructions back then was that you, you stitched the sleeve 
uh, of a woven garment or you stitch the sleeve of a knit garment just like a woven garment i.e. you you first stitch the side seam of the um, uh, the sleeve and then you attach the sleeve um, like stitches on the round just like you do with a, um, a regular woven shirt for instance now this was my belief for a long time because I had no access to much more helpful information than that because uh, sewing with this was definitely not something that was widely widely teached back then and so for me it was I think probably um, it must have been in the early 2000s basically when I started to examine um, uh, red to wear knit tops and realize that this is not how it's done and it also I because that was quite hard you know to get it even when you especially if you're working with a stretch knit so that's so I think yeah it was probably less than 20 years ago when I actually started to attach the sleeve on the flat instead so I'd love to hear your process and thoughts about that if you have done a similar journey like me or if you were actually had access to good information from the start and realized that it's actually much better to attach the the sleeve on the flat and when I say flat I mean that uh, you attach the sleeve seam and then you stitch together I'm oh, going to see here uh, so you start by attaching um, the sleeve head to the sleeve opening and then you attach the um, the entire uh, side seam and the sleeve seam in one swoop like this. So that's how it's done in the garment industry and it makes it much easier to get the sleeve to sit nice when you're sewing. Uh, for me it made a huge difference and it's also much faster so I really love to know if your journey with this has been and your thoughts about this. Um, Greg says on the flat is so much easier yes it's definitely is. and now I'm going to go on a rant because <laughs> I, I haven't sewn with uh, these pattern companies for a while but even back in the early 2000s um, both Butterick and Vogue patterns, I think, both uh, had, you know, garments that were clearly made for tight-fitting garments uh, using stretch knits. They still showed the method of, you know, first sewing the sleeve seam and then attaching it. And even worse, and now I'm going to get really upset, they had um, ease, just like you have done with the woven. So, it was a pain, you know, to uh, get the <laughs> excess fabric of the sleeve head. You have to make like gathering lines, just like you would insert a shirt sleeve <laughs> and try to get that fit. I, I hope they have stopped with this <laughs> type of method because I haven't used the, the, those patterns for knits in, in like uh, 15 years. So I have no idea if they still do it, but fingers crossed it's not. That I find deeply upsetting because it makes something that should be so easy so much more difficult so just to get this straight you definitely don't need any extra ease when you are attaching um, regular knit garments if you stretch it absolutely not I stand by that for 100% I'm sure there are some exceptions I'm not saying that but for the most part this distance should be the same as sleeve opening and secondly you should definitely attach it on the flat Rant over. <laughs> Sorry if I stepped on any toes now, but I definitely think that this is really important to keep in mind. And uh, Empress says, "No, oh my, thankfully I had good information from the beginning. I can't imagine it placing it like Owen. Yeah, no, it was a painful, painful experience." And Robin says, "Yeah, they still do all of that. Is in the knit sleeve. Oh, that makes me so upset." Um, and Jackie says, it sounds like to me like those companies built their instruction from existing models and that's why they don't match the correct taste. Probably, that's probably a way to streamline doing the pattern instruction to just use the same thing over and over again. But it's really upsetting. And Lorian says, I'm 64. I started sewing knit sleeves by sewing the sleeve seam and then inserting. And now, now Seaman showed me how to sew it and flat so much easier. Yes, thank you so much for people so, like... Nancy who's really has been so valuable and now she's sadly passed away uh, in teaching us so how to do good techniques when it comes to it. I was a big big fan of her um, and Elisa says what is the easiest way to finish the seam on the sleeve ribbing under the arm if you put them on the flat and I hate the serge seam sticking up 
I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I have some thoughts about that as well, and I might get heated again. Uh, so stay tuned for that at least, and I will talk about it. Um, Cecilia says, no way, always attach the sleeve and the flap, then sew the sign seam and wine giving. He experienced the 80s, they were great, but we've come a long way since then. True that, true that, Cecilia. And um, Hope says, stitch from the sleeve hem from the shirt hem. I'm going to answer that as well. So that's good segue now to how to attach it. Once you have attached in the flap, right, then it's time to stitch the this long seam that we just discussed. Now, in this very cheaply, quickly made, um, they have done what uh, you, Elisa, says you don't really like. Because if you are, you, you can either do two ways. For instance, um, if you, you can actually hem, hem the, uh, the sleeve when it's on the flat. So you do, you, before you even attach the sleeve opening, you have actually hemmed it. And this is a very common practice in the garment industry because you can just put sleeve after sleeve after sleeve and then you, like, you, you hem it with a cover stitch machine like this, bum, 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 like an, like an assembly line. It makes a lot of sense, uh, but it doesn't make for a nice inside finishing. So I personally prefer to hem the sleeve on the round just like I do on the bodice. So this is like the way I don't like it. It's just like you said, Elisa, uh, there's a bulky seam here and it, does, it doesn't look attractive and it, sometimes the, uh, the seam allowance can even pop out on the outside. So unless the sleeve is really, really small, uh, like if you're doing some children's clothes, for instance, if you're doing like a baby t-shirt, I can imagine that, you know, hemming that will be quite difficult. So there, there there's a place for this method, but I definitely believe that you should uh, hem afterwards for that nicer finish. And to answer your second questions, if you're going to start from the sleeve uh, or if you're going to start from the end of the hem I'd say I don't think there's a fast rule about that because I've seen instruction on both uh, one thing that is valuable to start from actually the sh the sleeve opening is that for the most part uh, again I'm sure there's exception but um, usually the the seam allowance when you're doing knit tops is usually pressed inwards so for instance if you like just like you're doing like um, a dress shirt uh, the seam allowance is always pressed towards the shoulder and then often stitched down but whereas if you're doing like a tailor jacket the seam allowance is actually working as um, as a way to build up the sleeve but for the most part um, it's usually pressed slightly inwards, so if that makes it easy to to get the seam allowance to, to flip inwards, it makes it easy to stop from the sleeve opening. But there's no hard fast rule. I definitely don't think I, I've I've been known to do both. <laughs> Sometimes I don't don't really think through things. I just start to stitch. And as I said, I've seen recommendations for both, and I've seen um, techniques using both. And also, for instance, on this blue top that I'm hearing, they have actually flipped the seam allowance. So one is facing to the left and one to the right to avoid bark. So again, no hard fast rule for sure, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, the um, Christina says, I totally agree about the stitch uh, stitch uh, <laughs> instructions there about knit sleeve. I think they do this to make it more difficult. I think they're afraid that we will make our own pattern. Pattern companies just make it harder. And definitely also, I think there might be like a trend shift. I'm I'm not super familiar because I don't really sew a lot of indie patterns, but I can imagine that perhaps they are a bit more current uh, than some of the older pattern companies that has been around for... Um, for decades, for instance, I am a big fan of Yali patterns. I think they their method for you know um, sewing knit garments is very contemporary and a good inspiration. I also like uh, Quick Sew because yeah, they probably Quick Sew was probably the one who actually taught me this method to be honest. Because I bought one of their books uh, like 20 years ago, and and they they also showed this method that we're talking about now about attaching it on the flat. Um, And this is it has a trick here. There's a trick. Start sewing the wrong way a few stitches until you reach the end with one stitch. Then flip the fabric and start sewing in the right way. 
oh i'm not 100 percent i'm following this cecilia it's probably me who's a little bit uh a bit thick in the head now but um is that referring to um uh when you're doing stitching out the uh, the the seam from the sleeve opening to the hem um so i'd love to hear more about that one um but that is that's how i do it so then of course we are actually going going quite that's a good thing about if you're doing like simple knit tops it's actually quite a quick process right so now we are actually at the point of doing hemming of on our knit top and uh, there are many ways of doing that as well um I would say that the probably the, the, the most important the most important one the most common one in the garment industry is definitely to use a cover stitch machine which is what they've done on this top uh, you definitely don't need to do that um, uh, the probably if you if I had a sewing machine I would definitely recommend using a twin needle uh, if you're having problems with uh, having the fabric of stretching out or if you're having problem with tunneling uh, you could definitely use some type of water soluble uh, stabilizer to keep that fabric in check when you're doing the twin needle because that can be a problem if, if the knit fabric is a bit stretchy or a little bit uh, loose so to speak uh, so that's definitely something you can start with a zigzag stitch of course as well uh, if your fabric is more stable I'm a big fan of actually using the good old blind hem stitch so I'm, uh, I'm going to show you a cardigan that I've been working on lately now granted this fabric is thicker so it's definitely not like a thin knit but what i've used here is uh the sewing machine blind hem stitch so so as you can see it's actually not visible from the outside and i've surged overcast the edges just using a regular sewing stitch and then i just use my regular machine blind hem stitch uh with the blind hem presser foot just to achieve this very nice finishing and uh, if you have a, like a more stretchy fabric you can um, change it so that you have more of the triangle or you can even use like a wide zigzag stitch uh, if you need to have a lot of stretch because obviously a regular blind hem stitch like, has like three three straights and one one triangle three, so that can you know make it less stretchy so you can definitely experiment and see if a zigzag stitch using the same principle can work as well but again if you're working with stretchy fabrics, having a serger or having a cobble stitch machine would definitely make hem easy and easier. And um, uh, let me see here if I. And Lorian says they probably they definitely are understanding Cecilia's tricks. So it's just me who's a little bit. Um, Oh yeah, 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 I understand what you mean now, yeah, because that's obviously definitely a problem now, because, uh, sorry that I didn't understand first, Cecilia, but um, obviously when you are doing the the one fell swoop thing, you will have a problem that, if I'm understanding correctly now, uh, that uh, one, it will stretch out, so it's really, really hard to get that sort of even finishing on the outside, so if correct me if I'm wrong now if I'm doing is so please please correct me in the comment section but uh, by using what Cecilia says is uh, you know stitching back it will probably control that better if I'm not mistaken here um, and um, Howard says wonder tape has become my best friend when hemming knits both on my sewing machine and my cover yes wonder tape double sided water soluble tape is amazing Definitely get that. It will solve so many of your problems and it washes away beautifully. Um, Jackie says the blind hem foot for overlockers, but the sewing machine version is less visible, I think. Absolutely. I'm just going to, I'm actually going to chat a little bit about how you can use the serger to hem a uh, t shirt just a bit here. And Laura says, yes, that's what she means. <laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry that I was a little bit slow, <laughs> slow in understanding, but I'm, I'm happy that I actually managed to get. And that's a great tip, by the way, Cecilia, because that's definitely something I still have, I'm struggling with. So I usually have to stop a little bit before and you know, just controlling the edge of the fabric, you know, manipulating it. Uh, but that your trick sounds much more sound than my method. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, yes, because before I move on to the cover machine, I will actually say if you have a surgery, there are actually two 
three three ways yeah there are actually three ways of um, hemming uh, nets using the serger if I'm not mistaken uh, or three ways there are two different they're basically the same stitch but using different methods so one which uh, Jackie says using the blind hem foot for overlockers uh, for instance my baby lock actually had one included uh, the big drawback of using the blind hem stitching uh, press foot on the serger is that the stitch is nothing there's nothing blind about it as it, it's 100% visible because uh, what, what will happen is that it will um, do like fairly visible ladder uh, ladder like um, um, ah, straight lines like this very uh, closely placed together now of course if you're sewing like a dark um, like a black t-shirt using black thread absolutely it can absolutely work and it's it's definitely not it's not it's not uncommon in the garment industry uh, I've seen it in a lot of vintage t-shirts um, that method and sometimes you can do have a little bit of fun with it as well and perhaps you'd like contrasting thread to get those um, rows of like um, straight lines like this uh, for instance this one is for the from the company alternative apparel they have used the blind hem so if you look close you can actually see you will probably not see it but uh, there's a lot of um, little stitches going like this so this is the blind hem there is actually a blind hemming machine as well uh, which is used in the garment industry but that unfortunately is not uh, able to mimic I think on a regular serger but Another tip that if you have a soldier is to use uh, the flat lock seam and instead of cutting the way the fabric and now this is too complicated uh, for me to explain in the video but I've addressed this method in my book Sewing Active Wear and I'm sure you can find tutorials online and you can definitely figure it out on your own as well is that you can actually use the flat lock seam which is when you pull the fabric apart it will on one side it will have those lateral stitches on the other side it will have like a, a looper stitch so if you disengage the knife and then you sort of fold the hem like a little bit of sandwich method, that's the trick. Uh, and then you just stitch along the fold and then you open it up and then you will have a really nice, and you can both use both use sides to so get a really decorative, nice stretch. And that I think is quite undervalued or underused. And it's really, really good if you have a surgery but not a cover stitch machine and want, you know, just to have that sort of really stretchy hem, you can definitely experiment using that method. I highly recommend that one as well. Uh, let me see here. Um, Jesse, what is your favorite t-shirt pattern? I love the one I'm wearing. Uh, I'm actually, most these days I'm drafting my own t-shirt patterns. Uh, so this one I've drafted myself. Um, hmm. I've also really liked, uh, I have like a basic uh, Boda I don't remember the, the pattern number off the top of my head. I know they discontinued, but they, they changed. I think it's a very similar draft. Uh, Boda, Boda style of Boda, has a really nice basic uh, pattern. The one I have is actually uh, comes both in male and female sizes. Uh, and they have a really good basic t-shirt draft, which I actually love, because it's not too boxy, because it has like a um, slight fit buzz on, on the male and the female version. Uh, so I can definitely recommend that draft and it's very similar I think even though the pattern number has changed but this is definitely a question I would love to hear you other you people in the in the chat because you will probably give much better information than I have because I'm so much drafting my own knit patterns at this point so I'd love to hear what are your favorite t-shirt patterns and I also know if you for instance have like a bigger um, uh, bust cap I know that some actually draft t-shirt patterns I think if you have like a C or D cap uh, so I think there are a lot of really good options these days to get a nice fitting t-shirt. Um, and uh, Lauren Payne says, I have a baby lock blind hair machine as well. Oh, very, very jealous, <laughs> Lorraine. Uh, hey, awesome. There are other machines on the market that don't seem to ex too expensive that look wonderful too. So that could be an option to explore. That would be like a dream machine. Um, and Christina, yes, it looks like a ladder stitch, yeah, for sure. But so you can definitely explore with that as well. And now I'm going to give you one more tip when you're doing hemming. Uh, most, because um, obviously you don't want buck. So if, if you're going to hem your top, uh, you don't want, if you have like a, 
because they will basically be let me see if I do the math right you know you will have like four layers of fabric right because you when you're stitching if you if you're folding now I'm going to explain this really really bad I wish I had made an example apologies in advance but what I'm trying to say here and you can also head over to my Instagram account lost stitch if you scroll down a bit I show this method but uh, what I do is that I clip the seam allowance at the fold line when I'm hemming so I actually flip the inner seam allowance to the opposite direction. I also talk about this in my books. Uh, and this is quite commonly used also in the garment industry. So for instance, on this pattern, this uh, t-shirt this also done this way. Now, when I share this tip, I got some feedback saying, oh, but yeah, but you know, the seam, if you clip the seam, it will unravel. I'm not saying that won't happen. Uh, it de definitely depends on your stitch. I have done literally hundreds of knit tops using this method and it's never happened because um, most um, if you're doing like a surgery like a four four thread regular overlock on your surgery it has two rows of um, needle stitches so you don't really clip all the way right but you clip uh, halfway and I've never had any problems with that either have, I've never had any problem using like a sewing machine overlock stitch doing the clipping uh, I also think that the fact that you're also top stitching over it using uh, the twin needle or uh, cover stitch machine, cover stitch, uh, that will also keep that in place. So of course I'm not saying that it will never happen but I am very confident in the, my recommendation of doing this. As I said I've done literally hundreds of knit tops over the years and I've never had this happen so that's definitely a recommendation especially if you're doing uh, on a cover stitch machine because that can be a bit sensitive when it's uh, sewing over a lot of thick layers because that can result in skip stitches so I'm definitely a big fan of clipping and you know flipping the seam allowance in opposite direction because that requires a really nice flat um, seam to stitch over if that makes sense Um, it just says thank you. I just bought a cover stitch machine, so I've been watching your videos a lot lately. You have so such helpful knowledge. Thank you for your videos, Chelsea, and thank you so much for telling me that. That makes me so happy to hear. Um, Greg says a lot of indie pattern companies have free T-shirt pattern. Gives you a chance to try a lot without having to make a monetary commitment. That's really good. I've seen that too. It's just like seen they have that like, sort of an introduction to the pattern lines and the methods. That's a really good way of exploring it. And Duncan says clipping the center flats out when folded over. And yet the under ask also Greg, how do you how can we find these free patterns? So please share. And also really curious if you have any other patterns, uh, t-shirt patterns to recommend. But I can definitely vouch for the Burda style basic t-shirt because they, they make really good. They used to have again, as we talked about earlier, they used to have ease in the sleeves, but they have stopped that, thank God. Uh, so that's definitely a blessing. Uh, when it comes to that, I uh, probably had lots of other things as well to talk about, but these are like the basic steps. And now you have to say, oh, but Johanna, you forgot this. <laughs> and uh, so please tell me now, because it's a little bit abstract for me to, to construct a t-shirt, you know, with actually sewing it together. So I might have missed a couple of steps there, but uh, this is like the basic principles of how I do it. I hope you find this helpful in, in some ways. And um we also got some pattern tips here. My favorite t-shirt is the green style green tee. I'm rectangular shape, not busty at all. It's a free PDF pattern. So there we have another tip, the green style uh, green tee. And green style also makes really good knit patterns. They do a lot of active wear, you know, in classic, very red wear inspired garments. And uh, uh, Greg says, Melly sews, love notions, five out of four, SBCC, but it's so many. This is so valuable. I, I see if I can I can um, save the chat in some ways, and then I can compile a list of uh, this all this list of t-shirt patterns. And um, Stylark has free patterns, I believe, monthly. And Cecilia also has another tip. Great tip, Cecilia, and that is you can use your surgery for a lettuce edge as well, because. Um, a lettuce edge is when you overcast the edge of the fabric and you get this sort of wavy look and you can actually see that quite a lot of the wear and you know like underwear tops and stuff like that so that's definitely and Cecilia to bring up that it's um, if you're having like a tricky knit like for instance a rib knit that doesn't uh, just stretches out like crazy then using 
uh, some type of electricity. Also, you can use a serger and you can also use a sewing machine. Sorry if I, I missed... I probably said this wrong because sometimes I, when I mix up English and Swedish, um, you can use a let's edge um, uh, doing a regular zigzag stitch on your sewing machine or some type of decorative stitch. So you can actually fold it twice and then you can stitch over and that provides beautiful because most sewing machines have some type of overcasting decorative stitch and then you can get this lettuce shape. So. Uh, but you can also use like a roll hem, because that's what I said wrong. You can also use a roll hem on the serger. So you have lots of different options to explore for sure. Um, and Jekyll says, I don't make a lot of t-shirts, but I see lots of people struggling with roping of hems, diagonal creasing. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. And especially if you're using a sewing machine, uh, as I talked about earlier, it can sort of move the upper layer of fabric uh, forwards and that would distort it. So you definitely need to ha keep it in control. For instance, we talked about the water-soluble wonder tape. That's one option. Other two water-soluble uh, stabilizer can help that as well. And also, you might need to control the fabric. I actually don't use a walking foot. I instead either use uh, this all where I actually feed um, the fabric towards the presser foot. So when I'm stitching knits, I actually use this to uh, push the upper layer back, and that will quite that works really well with with um, silk fabrics and everything that will get the rope in. You just push that gently back like in, in a rhythmic motion. Hope that makes sense. Uh, and you also you can use your fingers just to sort of manipulating that. So that's a, it comes with practice I think. Uh, so usually when you get a lot of roping you have actually not been able to control the fabric as well. So that comes with practice if that makes sense. And Mary, I'm so glad to hear about the SBCC for petit patterns. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, we have a really nice uh, list here of uh, tips as well. Uh, so that's really, really good. And I hope that you found this uh, live stream useful. <laughs> and if you have any more questions, please ask away now. And I will, I will try to copy this list of indie pattern makers so you can get a nice contemporary list about sewing patterns. And also, as I said, I'm a big fan of um, the Yali patterns. I think they make excellent knit tops. I haven't actually made a t-shirt pattern, but I've done a lot of tight fitting uh, knit tops from them. And I really like them. Also, they have a nice um, smaller seam allowance. I think it's um, six, six millimeters, which is... Uh, Oh, I keep keep forgetting this uh, the inches number, but it's like less than less than one centimeters, which makes it really perfect for a serger or um, a overlock stitch on a sewing machine because that's usually have the same width as well. Because also another now I'm going off on a rant again, but another gripe that I have with Butterick and I'm obviously naming names here is at least in the past they used 1.5 um, centimeters or five eight inches seam allowance when you're working with really stretching it so you have to remove tons of fabric because you, obviously you can't have a seam allowance this wide when you're uh, stitching a sleeve or if you're attaching the ribbing and Boda style again another fender and they'll have you cut it away but why not have less seam allowance <laughs> to begin with and make it much easier to stitch together because obviously the wider seam allowance the more difficult it will be in the curves and stuff like that oh don't get me started I'm very upset about that one <laughs> Yes, and uh, one one four inches six centimeters uh, six millimeters. Thank you so much, Cecilia, again for your fantastic knowledge. And um, thank you so much. Um, Howard says, always terrific. Thank you, thank you so much, Howard. Greg says, time flies when we're having fun. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for being around. Uh, Lisa, thank you, thank you so much. Sarah, thank you for all the winners. You're fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> and excellent. Oh, Howard, thank you. Says, excellent. Always, thank you so much. And Mary said, this was so great. Many thanks to Jan and all the comments. Yes, and thank you so much to all of you who have commented because this chat has been on fire. I had no idea that this was such a lively topic. So it's been so fun and I wish I could save the chat. I do actually think if you watch the replay, I do think you can actually see the chat these days on YouTube. I think they made some changes. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and Laura says, I love your tip of listening sewing steps to have machines prepared. Save something. Yeah, that's really good. I have a video about that as well if you want to check out how I do my preparation. Uh, that makes it so much easier. And Leah says, thank you. And Wayne, thank you. Tack. Yes, that's right. We have a C. So it's T-A-C-K. That's tack. 
So it's very similar like you do like a bar tack on your on your sewing machine. That's how we say tack in Sweden. <laughs> and Doris says, love seeing all the different countries represented sewings coming back with events. I yes, I so much agree with that. It's so fantastic to see that so many people popping out now and being so enthusiastic about garment sewing. That makes my heart melt and it's so wonderful to, to see that. Um and Rachel Cruz says, thank you, some terrific idea to try out. That's really good to hear. And we also got some really great suggestions in the chat. So I definitely hope that you who are watching this afterwards can also take part in all the amazingly valuable information in the chat as well. Thank you so much. And there will be another live stream in the last Sunday of May. If nothing unforeseen happens, I will announce it as usual on my blog, in my newsletter, on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, I think. <laughs> if I can forget all, I sometimes don't remember all that stuff. But you can definitely know that unless something unforeseen happens, there's usually a live sewing chat the last Sunday of each month. Thank you so much for this amazingly fun live stream. I feel really energetic about this and it was so fun. So until next time, bye bye.